Hey everybody, welcome back to Eggs. This week's special guest is Riley Meek. Riley is the founder and CEO of the Social Dynamic Selling System, which turns dinner seminar marketing into a science. After responding to a small ad on Craigslist in 2009, Riley was introduced to a new concept of selling, one which has radically changed his life forever. Having just $673 in his bank account, but more importantly, a burning desire for more, Riley went on to produce over $100 million in sales over the past nine years. Now that he's perfected his model through continual trial and error, he's sharing this learned wisdom and is on a mission to help other entrepreneurs and business owners achieve the revenue goals they have they have to live the lifestyle they desire. Everything he teaches is tried, tested, and refined, and proven to create predictable, sustainable, and scalable selling system. So here to talk about all that and so much more is our guest, Riley Meek. How are you, Riley? Good, Ryan. Thanks for the intro, man. Absolutely. Glad to have you here. Nice meeting you. Yeah. Yeah, let's, uh, let's take a step back in time. You said you saw an ad on Craigslist in 2009, and that's kind of what got you all into this. Um, yeah. What was the ad for? How did how did that kind of open your doors into sales? Yeah, man, it was uh, well, it was a unique time in my life. I just returned uh, from Mexico from a you know basically a failed business venture, and um, I was I was you know on a, a quest or a journey, I guess, just looking for that next opportunity. And of course, Craigslist was the place to go at that time. Um, it's funny to say now, but it, the ad simply said uh, work three days a week and make ten thousand bucks. So I thought, yeah, right, right. Like <laughs> that's not possible. Um, but of course, I I had to inquire upon it, and um, that was when I was I was you know first introduced to this this concept of selling you know one to many versus one on one. And at first, I didn't really didn't I didn't really comprehend what that meant um, because everything I had done prior to that was I've always been in sales, um, but it was always. You know what I what I loved about that the concept of you know earning what you're worth or just being on commission um, was the idea that you know they they always touted that you know your your earning ability is uncapped or you know you can earn as much as you're worth and I realized that wasn't really true because you know there's only a certain amount of time in the day and certainly I could sell higher ticket items make higher commissions things like that. Uh, maybe hire a, a you know and manage a sales team to to earn overrides, but there's still a, only a certain amount of time in a day in which you know depending upon how long your presentations go, you're going to run out of time. Or just emotionally, you can only go so far. So, um, so I, I didn't really buy into that that concept. But when I saw this, this gentleman told me I, I responded to the ad and got on the phone with this guy, and he started talking about selling to groups of people versus one on one. And I didn't really grasp, grasp that until he actually invited me to one of his events. Uh, I was a couple hours away and I, I drove down and I walked into this room and, and he had you know roughly 25 or so people there and he delivered a presentation. And after the fact, he simply asked for a follow-up appointment. And so it was a way in which he was kind, you know, kind of sifting the sand um, to only meet with those that were actually serious enough to inquire upon the price or you know, maybe had more questions that, that gave him the ability to, you know, leverage his time, um, but also his marketing dollars uh, by, by selling to a group of people versus just marketing to sell one on one. So um, I have a hard enough time getting one client versus 25 people in the door. <laughs> uh, how do you go about, you know, getting them there initially? I mean, I mean it, it's almost like, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it seems like a pretty hard process to get 25 people there in the first place. It can be. It certainly can be. However, you know, whenever, now that we, I had my own companies at the time in which um, we were selling, we sold numerous different products and services with this format. Um, but now when we take on clients to teach them this, we always start with the end in mind, of course, which is who is your true client avatar, right? Who is your ideal client? And, and some people have no clue. Like anybody can, this product great for anybody. Um, so, but we really want to dial that in and get super, super hyper specific on that because that's going to allow me to um, identify how I'm going to uh, market to them. Is it, you know, we do a ton of direct mail. Uh, is it Facebook? Is it, you know, other, uh, you know, cold calling, whatever it is. And we want to target um, how that person is going to respond. And then we craft our message based upon, you know, how, how they're going to respond as well. Um, so we, there's, a number of ways that we can go about doing it, but we have to understand who the true client is 
first, and then we can determine how the message that we're going to craft, uh, the media that we'll actually use to get them to take action and, and respond to our initial marketing. That yeah, I think it's I, I think it's one of these things that seems so obvious, but I think so many people miss it. I wonder, do you have any any pointers or like how is there a process that you go through in helping somebody try and understand who their end user is or who their customer is? I've seen models in the past or like, you know, I work in the marketing advertising industry and we we a lot of times will craft personas, you yeah. know, try and create an idea of a persona. But if you're just starting out in business, you're trying to maybe find a, a fit somewhere, you know, how might you te- uh, talk to somebody or teach somebody to identify their their primary customer? Yeah, so it, it's it's easier, obviously, if you're already selling your product or service to kind of reverse engineer who that is. You know, if you've got the data where uh, we can reverse engineer who that that true client is, um, that's that's an easier process, of course, to to be able to do that. But for a startup, you know, somebody that's just coming out the gates, they don't they don't have a sales system, they haven't even sold anything yet. It's you know, somewhat of it is a guessing game. Uh, uh, out the gates, right? We can't, we don't know necessarily, you know, you can have the best product in the world, but if your message sucks, it is, you know, you're not going to sell anything. Like if you build it, they do not come. I don't care what anybody (laughs) tells you, you have to have a sales system in place to, to attract clients. And, um, if, if you're starting out right now and you don't know, sometimes you really just have to kind of think of who, what problem does that product solve? Right, because that's that's really what we're selling. We're not selling the product. We're selling the benefits of the product, and even further than that, the benefits of the benefits of that product. And that's how we're going to be able to craft a message to speak to that again, hopeful or potentially ideal client um, to get them to take action and want to even listen to you, want to want to even care to listen to you to come on out to an actual you know live event. Uh, so some of it out the gates, it, it can be a guessing game, but we do want to at least narrow it down. And then as a true marketer, we're, we're constantly testing. You, you always have to have an A-B test and, and we're continually, you know, what, what messaging works today is totally different than what worked three months ago, right? Like it's because just, you know, times have changed, of course, with, with what's going on in just society. And so you constantly need to be um, testing your marketing, your messaging to make sure that you're continually getting better. Um, otherwise, you know, you, you're either progressing or you're regressing, right? And so as a true marketer, we're constantly doing that with all of our, our messaging and the media that we're using, again, whether it's direct mail or Facebook or you know, SEO, whatever it is. So how does your system kind of differ from just you know, a normal sales process? Uh, it, your company's called Social Dynamic. Um, yeah. It, what, can you define that for us? Like, it, it, what's the social aspect of it that that uh, yeah. sets you apart? Absolutely. And I think I get this question a lot. And really, why we even called the company Social Dynamic Selling System is is because of that. Is I want that question because uh, a lot of people just think, oh, it's social media or you know, social selling, whatever that is. But really, at the core of it, there's a social dynamic that happens in any given relationship, any given situation. You know, right now there's a social dynamic having, you know, going on between the three of us, you know, it could be via computer and and audio, but there's still a social dynamic that's happening here. Or if you go out to, you know, a restaurant or a bar, there's, there's you there, there's other patrons, there's the bartender, the hostess, and there's a dynamic that's happening there within a group setting. And what we've done is we've taken that and we've, we just simply by knowing how people Uh, react or respond and and how to communicate effectively, we can use that to our advantage um, within a group selling process, selling one to many versus just selling one on one. So the social dynamic is a key component to taking people on an emotional journey when we're delivering our presentation, um, getting them to, you know, hypnotically say yes within their, you know, their subconscious mind. So at the end of it, we're creating an environment where they simply want to do business with you right? Nobody wants to be sold, but everybody wants to buy. And so what we've done is been able to create that environment where people simply, for whatever reason, they just want to do business with us uh, versus, you know, feeling like they're pressured or, you know, they're, they're, 
you know, at a timeshare meeting and they're, you know, can't leave because the door's locked or whatever the case well, is. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I've been to a few of those timeshare meetings and they're pretty uh, confrontational. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're, they're just one of those, you go in for the free, you know, like uh, boat ride in Cabo. And now all of a sudden you signed up for a $30,000 condo that you didn't want. Right. Um, isn't that kind of predatory? I mean, like, isn't there like the, the manipulation tricks that you, that they want to sign up at the end? Isn't that kind of like a, I don't know. I, I've been to a few of those seminars and, you know, like the, the real estate, get rich million dollars in two days or the, yeah. you know, like you show up because your friend invited you out and all of a sudden you're selling knives for Cutco. Like what's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I love it, man. You know, yeah. So a, a couple of things that I, I want to address on that because I I love talking about this too because you know with with what we teach we use a lot of NLP neuro linguistic programming and and how to speak to people's subconscious mind. But by no means is any of it manipulative. I mean, you simply you can't make somebody do something they don't want to do, right? Like at the end of the day, it, because we get just as many no's as we get yeses. And, and I don't care about that because I know the numbers with our system and it, it, the numbers always work out. Um, and if I can quickly get to a no, that's great. I don't have to waste my time on that. Um, so we're, we're definitely not the rah, rah, rush to the back of the room, get your you know, $48 real estate course that I'm going to upsell you into a, you know, something else, something else, something else. That's not us by any means. Um, we are all about no like, and trust. Right. Sure. And then that's what I think people uh, appreciate nowadays because the salesman of old is it doesn't work anymore. Right. This, you know, slick sales guy that's rolling in, he's got the Rolex like that. That does not work anymore. People are intelligent and they're, they're becoming more sophisticated buyers. So we have to create an environment in which they, they know us uh, and, and why we host a lot of these events in just uh, restaurants, you know, private rooms within a local restaurant is because it is a social setting, again, the social dynamic aspect of it, but it's in a, in a location that they've probably been to before, right? They've probably had dinner there before because we're picking a decent restaurant. Um, and the, so they're comfortable, right? They know how to, they know where the parking is. They can walk in, they can feel like they're just going out for a nice dinner. They're, the door is never locked. You know, if somebody wants to get up and leave in the middle of my presentation, I invite them to do it, right? Because there's things that I can actually do to win that crowd over because they're all going to think that that guy's a, a butthead, right? Like, so there, there's, there's all, there's key components that, that we teach all of our clients um, to always use in your favor uh, through the selling process. Because if people know you that you, and you know, you're a likable person, right? Some of that just isn't teachable. Some people just aren't likable people, <laughs> but they're going to like you. And then certainly they're, they're going to trust you. If you did a compelling enough presentation they trust you. And then all we're doing is asking for that next appointment. Like, Hey, just if, if this is a, was of interest to you, you know, we create sense of urgency, of course, to get them to take action now. Um, but then we're meeting with them either, you know, after the presentation or the following day. Um, if, if they're coming into a clinic setting, like we work with, with a lot in um, the medical world um, where they'll come in for a consultation in a clinic or we're going out to their home or we're meeting um, at, uh, at a, you know, another social setting, a coffee shop, whatever it is. Um, and then at that point, you know, there's zero manipulation in, involved with that. We've just sifted the sand. You know, I kind of call this like our offline funnel, right? You, everybody hears about funnels online and really we've taken it offline where we're, we're giving people that social, you know, aspect of being able to earn that know, like, and trust that sometimes can't come across in a webinar, um, or, you know, a short sales call or whatever that is. And I, and I think especially now, as we're as we're you know coming out of uh, you know being on lockdown, I think it's going to be something that more and more people are just going to be craving is just that social interaction with people that that we've been you know deprived of over the last couple months. So uh, the, the that aspect of it, I know I, I went long on this question for you, but um, I, I think the there's zero manipulation at, at all involved with this. Um, it's more about influence in authentically persuading people to make a decision that they, they already know they want it or they don't, right? Otherwise, they're not going to give me that second appointment if this was of zero value or zero interest to them. Sure. Well, I think it's one of the things that you brought up sort of early and sort of hit again there in the recap is that you're, you know, you're selling the benefits of the benefits. You're, you're you know, trying to solve a problem that they may or may not have, right? So, 
whether consciously or subconsciously they have this problem, they already have the understanding of whether this thing you're doing is going to work for them or not. And by selling the benefits, you give people the opportunity to sort of, I don't know, mentally shift things around and go, oh, okay, well, this is an issue that I've been trying to work through. Maybe this thing would help. And so, you know, to the idea of being predatory or manipulative, I think the, you know, the fact of the matter is that basically by selling the benefit and not pushing the product, you know, versus, you know, saying, oh, well, this is the be all end all slices, dices, cuts and julienne's fries, all this stuff, you know, you you can actually, you know, speak to the benefits of the thing. And if that benefit happens to align with the need, then there's, you know, some room for further discussion. And so I, I think that maybe that's the difference. And then I guess, the social dynamic, you know, that you mentioned is sort of the differentiator between traditional sales styles. And so I wondered, though, you know, we were talking about kind of what make, what makes you guys different as, you know, different sales processes exist and things like that. But I wonder if you couldn't just take us sort of through a traditional sales process, like people who haven't had sales training might not even really understand what, you know, why we might need a sales process of some variety. You know what I mean? Like, I think people understand inherently the idea that, you know, I have product, I sell, you know, gasoline or peanuts or whatever it is, you know, I, you have a product to sell and, you know, obviously we're selling all the time, you know, know me, like me, trust me, you know, to sort of hit the elements you were talking about. So we're selling all the time, but I wonder if people have ever really thought, or for a lot of people, maybe they've never even really thought about what a process feels like. And yeah. I guess what I'm talking about is maybe a little bit more tactical, you know, like sort of what are the steps of developing your sales relationship? Yeah, dude, this is fantastic because we didn't even talk about this, but I literally just finished our my second book that we're, um, we're it's going into be you know, publishing and things right now and just created an, another course on this on you know really what we call the social dynamic selling process the, the blueprint and it, it boils down to really uh, you know five components of it and the very very first thing it, everybody's always probably heard this but is that building rapport right like that's that's crucial and and so we teach our clients to you know how to do that you know almost instantaneously, you know, upon meeting somebody, uh, by, by learning things like matching and mirroring and, and, um, you know, and, and just getting them to, you know, matching their voice, their voice, their tonality, their, you know, the, the timber, the, 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 uh, how loud they talk, talk versus how quiet they talk, you know, just different things like that, that we help people, um, to d- develop that rapport. Again, that's the first component of knowing and, and liking people, right? You, people want do business with those that they like. Right. They don't buy stuff, something from somebody that has turned them off or, you know, isn't necessarily like them. People want to do business with those that they like. So we always build rapport and then um, effectively asking questions. You know, asking questions is is what's going to allow you to uh, identify the actual need. Right. So build rapport, effectively asking questions. And then once we've gathered those questions, uh, so we teach people how to do this, you know, effectively. By continually, and it could be as simple as continually asking why, you know, why, why, and, and ultimately it's going to boil down to um, identifying the need that they actually have. What is that that true need? And then by your offer, if, if what your product is or your service is of value, you link that need to your offer, right? That's the, the fourth step is linking that need to the offer by showing, by creating value under, so they understand that your need can solve their problem. And then obviously closing. Right, the the how to how to actually effectively close by using things like embedded commands um, and and overcoming objections. Because if it, if you haven't overcome your objection, if you're continually getting objections, that's a telltale you know a telltale point of what you should add into your presentation. Right, of establishing that value and linking your need to, to that. So we teach in all in all of our presentations, it's we're we're identifying what those first objections are. And, and then I'm going to, I'm going to put them in a story format within my presentation. So even if it's subconsciously, that objection is not that, that, that it's, it's coming across to my potential customer or client, um, that objection shouldn't happen at the end. If it is, then I'll just have to say, remember, I mentioned this, you know, it's, so it's an easy transition. If you hit all five of these components, um, or if you're getting, a, if you're continually getting an objection, just go back to step number three, you know, which is um, identifying the need and linking your need to that. And then again, continuing through the actual closing process. So those are the five key components in any, any sales situation that people, if they want to effectively present and close better, just sticking to those five things 
Um, and uh, it, your, you know, your sales rate, your close rate is going to drastically go up. So, well, oh, go, go ahead, Ryan. Oh, I was just going to say, no, I think it's really interesting. I've been doing a lot of reading lately on some of these different things. So it was interesting to hear. Um, I just finished a guy named Chris Voss's book that, you know, he's a like former FBI negotiator or something. Yeah. You know, he talks a lot about the, you know, these tools like mirroring and, and sort of, you know, uh, reflecting things back and yep. all that kind of stuff. And so it was interesting to hear you hear, say some of these things because it's sort of tying together a lot of the, the reading I've been doing. And uh, I look at these systems like, I mean, I mean, one that I've been introduced to is called like, I think it's called the Sanders submarine or something. And it's got sort of these different steps, you know, sort of broken like this with sort of a, an interim, you know, ask to get you into the next phase of the thing. And so it's kind of interesting to hear how you've sort of built that into this social selling process that you're doing, you know, that there's this underlying sort of tried and true methodology. And now you've added the social component, which just takes things to kind of another level. So I, I think it was really interesting. Mostly wanted compliment to it. Sure. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. Uh, I was just going to say, um, your current product that you're personally selling is sales training. Uh, what other industries have you worked with uh, that you've taught people how to sell or sell their product? Um, you know, because really your product isn't really a physical item. It's not widget A. It's more like we're going to teach you how to sell someone else's, your, your actual, you know, if you're a right. real estate agent, we're getting clients for you. If we're doing this, right. we're, we're helping you work through that. What industries have you worked with? Yeah, a lot of industries. So I first started out in selling like, I mean, it's going to be funny because I'm literally the least handyman person on the planet. My wife actually hangs the pictures in our house because I just <laughs> can't do it. Uh, so, but I started out selling like insulation for home residential, LED lighting, um, you know, weather stripping around doors, just things like that, that would make homes more energy efficient. Right. And it wasn't because I loved being energy efficient. I'm not like, you know, go green type of guy, but it's, it, it was a need. And I, you know, I just identified what's a need that's out there right now. And what can I provide? Is, is there a solution that I could provide? And so that's where we started out. Um, and fr through that process, I realized, you know, obviously a ton of trial and error, uh, but we did, you know, our first six months, we did 2.1 million in sales selling these products. And went on the next year, we did another 12 million, another 12 million. At that point, I realized the system is really what worked. The product was kind of irrelevant. And so I started a, a, another company and um, we helped with uh, like, a, you know, aging in place, like, um, stair lifts, walk-in bathtubs, uh, barrier-free showers, things like that. Again, a need that's out there. Every single day, over 10,000 people are turning the age of 65 and people want to stay in their home. So it's like I, I found out what that need was and could I provide a solution for it? And so uh, and then from there, obviously, we've, this is, you know, financial advisors, attorneys have been using this model for decades. Um, it's not like I've invented this by any means. I've just, I think I've perfected it. And um, we've, we've been able to do it in numerous different verticals in like the home remodeling industry, um, medical, uh, you know, dental, uh, like, you know, cosmetic surgeries, things like that. The travel industry, um, not, not shady timeshare stuff, um, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a preface that, uh, but we've done like investment clubs. Um, so it, the industry is really irrelevant as long as there's, there's one key component to to using this format because it, we always start when we onboard a, a new client, we always start with a strategy call. Like I'm not just going to all of a sudden take a client on if I, if I know that this isn't an effective way for their product or their service to, to take it to market because this does take money, you know, to, to fill events because we're, we're filling events and we're buying them dinner, right? That's the, the hook. We're getting them to, to come to the event because we're buying them a nice steak dinner. Um, so it takes money to do this. So if you have a $48 widget with no additional lifetime value to that customer, I will be the first to tell you that you shouldn't do this. You know, use our online guys and build out an online funnel for that, right? Because there's just not enough margin in that product to make this system, you know, self-sustaining. Because our, our goal, we always, we, we typically started again, starting with the end in mind, we always want to have like a 300% ROI on your campaign. So if, if I know that it's going to take 5,000 bucks to host your, you know, three seminars this week, I want to make sure that I can at least, you know, return 15 grand on that thing. 
right? If not, maybe we need to look at a different form of marketing or um, if, if I can um, make way more than that, great, then let's pour some gas on the marketing and, and really you know, turn this thing on. But at the end of the day, typically, you know, we want at least about a thousand dollar you know, profit margin within a product in order to make this system, you know, really work. So, and that's why I always say profit margin because, you know, we have people that sell these investment clubs where it's five grand to get in. And then it's, that's, there's zero cost of goods in that. So that, that works beautiful. But then I could have a, uh, you know, a solar company that maybe has a, a $10,000 package, but their cost of goods could be, you know, six grand, right? So there's 4,000 profit there. And I want to make sure that we go about this as, as, uh, as wise as possible for our clients, because it doesn't do me any good to take a client on and fail, right? The only way that we succeed is if I can assure their success, right? Cause I, I don't want, I'm not looking for a one and done type of approach. I want this to be a lifelong relationship uh, and, and to be a true selling system. That's why we call it the predictable, sustainable and scalable selling system. Well, so I wonder, just sort of as an extension to that question, you know, the, you know, what industries is this best for? I think that was good to find some clarity around the, the types of things that this might work for. Um, but can everybody sell? You know, so you mentioned earlier at the beginning of the, of the show, some people just being unlikable, which I totally understand. But generally speaking, I mean, because I, I think a lot of people, especially entrepreneurs, they might, you know, go start a company or something because it's a passion or they've got something they're really interested in or whatever. But the brass tax of it is, You've got to sell it to make money. You've got to, you know, be able to profit to actually move forward. So, I mean, can anybody sell? Like, should somebody come to you and just say, hey, I need to, you know, improve my selling skills. So this is the, the guy to talk to. And does it work for basically everybody? Or is there a certain type of person that you think is the, the you know, the key guy, you know, yeah. back to identifying customers, you know, yeah. who is yours? Yeah, that's perfect, man. Because how I actually transitioned from my own company selling these products and services to now teaching people how to do this was literally, I was, I came home on a Wednesday night. Um, we were hosting our events on Mondays and Tuesdays, and then I would meet with people one-on-one -on -one, Tuesdays, Wednesdays. So I was actually working three days a week and making well over 10,000 bucks and doing that, that, that Craigslist ad was, was accurate. Um, but I, I had zero passion and you mentioned passion, Ryan, and I think that was key. I had zero passion for those products that we were selling. Like I could give a rip about them. What I had passion for was providing for my family, right? Like that's why I, I get out of bed every morning was is to be able to provide. But I, I thought back, I came home that night. It was my wife and daughter were already asleep. And I just, for those that have, that are listening that, you know, maybe they've experienced some success and financially everything's good to go, but they just still feel like that unfulfillment like that just that desire that there's something more out there that was exactly what i had felt like financially things were great we just built the house and everything was you know good on the surface but i just had that, that desire for there's something else out there i didn't care about any of these products and I, I thought back to the you know when i first started out before doing these e group events selling one-on-one -on -one and the continual you know, feast and famine kind of lifestyle that we had because I never knew where my next lead was coming from, where the next sale was coming from. And that, that sucked, right? To be frank. And, and I thought back like, man, that was a terrible feeling. And I know there are brilliant entrepreneurs out there that have a, a wonderful product, a wonderful service. That's their passion, but they don't know how to get it out to the masses. Right. And so I, I knew my passion was people and being able to pour into them and build them up. So if I found somebody with a product or service that was passionate about it, and like I said, if you build it, they don't come, you've got to have a system in place. Could I, could, could my system be the product? That, that's what, how this all kind of came about. And I just started to write everything that we've learned from, you know, some of the stuff we've, we've talked about here on crafting your message to how to set the room up, how to negotiate with restaurants, um, the scripting that we use to make sure people actually show up on the confirmation calls um, all of that I just kind of wrote into what you know is now known as the social dynamic selling system, and so I realized through learning through this process and taking on new clients, as you said, Ryan, like there's some people are just they're unicorns and they have the gift to charm and and sell and they're fantastic. You know, those are the easy clients, right? But then sometimes you do get the 
engineer guy who would love to tell you all the facts and figures and, you know, and, and he can sell to other engineers that way. But every buying decision, I don't care what anybody says, every buying decision is emotional. Now, in the, as I said, it needs to be backed by logic in order for it to, you know, not cancel or, you know, walk out of the timeshare room like, like you had mentioned and be like, what the heck did I just buy? Uh, it, so every buying is, decision is emotional. And I learned that we had to teach people this process, right? So uh, we take, we, when we take on a client, we teach them, you know, how to stand in front of the room, where to stand in front of the room, how to use different techniques like anchoring. Um, so we can definitely teach that, right? And, and I, I, I'm living proof of this because, man, when I was a sophomore in high school, I, in speech class, I, I, I literally, you know, what did I have? Probably 15 kids in my class. I grew up in small town, South Dakota, but I would stand in front of the room and I would just tremor in my hands, holding my note cards. Like, and, and those are people that I knew. Like, why, why would I be so, get so nervous through them? And, you know, that was a terrible, terrible experience. And so for my speech Mr. Fonder is his name. I, I, if he could see me now speaking at, at all these events, I, I would imagine he'd be impressed. But that, that's living proof that this can be learned um, if, you, if that's your desire. But if it's not, we have a program in which we can, can train a, a sales rep. We can do the hiring process uh, for you and build your sales team. Um, or you, you, know, you can hire us to do it yourself. We take on a, a few kind of done for you clients each year. Um, you know, on a case by case basis, essentially, just because we don't have time to do do that for all of our clients. Um, but that's just kind of determined in part of our strategy call in our, our initial strategy days, we, we really lay out the foundation of the program, and then determine, you know, our level of engagement on what you can do, what we can do, does it make sense? You know, what are your capabilities? And then out of that day, we, we can, you know, really have a roadmap to success on, on starting out your, your initial campaigns. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Um, a, as a way to sort of extend that even one step further, at what stage in a process would it be best for somebody to approach you? So, for example, I'm already working for a company. We're trying to improve sales. You know, am I the guy who should be coming to you, or do you, do you take the guy, or do you like the guy who is the you know startup founder who maybe doesn't even have a product yet, but is just trying to learn some foundational stuff? Like, at what stage in the game should people? you know, I, I guess really start getting heavy into the sales stuff. Cause I suspect, and, and maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I suspect that most people don't think about sales until it's kind of too late. They've already built right. their widget and now it's like, crap, I, I've got a hundred of these in my garage and I, now I need to move them, you yes. know? And, and so I suspect that's when people come on board, but when would be the prime time to, to really step into a, a relationship with you guys? Yeah, I would say it, the sooner, the better. Um, and, but on, Unfortunately, that's usually what happens, as you mentioned, is people have this idea and then they're like, okay, can I even sell this thing now? Do, do people even want this? You know, I wanted it, but now that I've built this or what, whatever the product is, this, the sooner the better because sales cures a lot of things, especially with the startup, right? If you don't have revenue, you know, and I've never had an outside investor or anything like that. It was like, I, I self-funded everything that, that we had to do and I encourage are people to do that too, because you know relying on outsourced revenue is our, our outsourced funding or something. Maybe you have to give up a piece of your company. I like to, I love to take people on that are in the startup phases. They don't know how to, uh, you know, uh, buy enough product or inventory, and, and we can do that by pre-selling things for them um, through this format. So the sooner the better. There's never a bad time by any means. If 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 you're looking to you know, if you're a hundred million dollar company and your goal is to be 200 million, we can show you how to do that. And that, that's really the, the scalable aspect of our, our system as well is because, you know, I'll just give a, a quick example. We had a, a, a solar company that um, hired us. This has been a couple of years ago uh, down in Florida. And again, I didn't really know much about solar at all. I guess the sun hits these panels and turns, you know, AC or DC into AC, whatever it is. I didn't know anything <laughs> about it, but I know how people make buying decisions. And so uh, th this company, I flew into Florida. We, we filled uh, uh, three separate days of events for them. Uh, we flew into Florida. Um, they delivered a presentation firsthand. It was God awful. Uh, and they got like no appointments out of it. And I said, all right, let me do this next one. It was a back-to-back -back presentations. Uh, and we did the presentation um, we, there was, I think 25 opportunities for appointments in there. We ended up generating 13 
appointments to meet with the next day. And then I went out with them the next day in the field and we ended up selling over $200,000 in solar projects within that, you know, 48 hour time period. Um, I didn't know anything about solar. I still don't, I don't care to know anything about it, but we do know how people make buying decisions and getting them to, you know, people, people view things with in pictures, right? People that you can tell them all the different facts and figures and everything about how the sun hits the panel and whatever else. But at the end of the day, they want to know how it's going to benefit them. And, and that's how we get them to picture what that's going to feel and look like to do your part to, uh, you know, help take care of the environment or to open up your, your utility bill and notice that it's, you know, you know now 12 bucks instead of, 230 bucks, like what that's going to feel like. We want to bring up those emotions for them, um, you know, through this whole, you know, sales process. I have no idea where I was going with this, Ryan. <laughs> Get me back on track. <laughs> no, I think that's great. That was just us sort of trying to determine, you know, who would be an ideal customer, you know, for, for your system. And, and I think that, that that sort of helps clarify. I think, you know, like we like we mentioned, there are so many people who maybe wait until lo- too late in the game. And I can even sort of picture even in my own life, you know, hearing what you're talking about me going, well, I'm not quite ready. You know, the business isn't far enough along to think about that or, you know, whatever. And uh, so I could see maybe people be a little hesitant. So I was trying to sort of unearth that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I wonder, though, it just as a tangential item. Uh, just because it was a service you guys sit at, or that you mentioned that you do sometimes too, is maybe we could talk a little bit about sales reps and finding out when you need one. Um, yeah. Again, you know, the like we've sort of talked about issues around this, which is you know, can everybody sell, and you know, how to how to you know make a determination whether you're the guy, and and now we've sort of discussed when you should maybe think about doing this. But what if you are just sort of the visionary at a company, for example, and maybe you you've got the message. But God, it's just not in you to be out there and be the sales guy. You know, when is the the right time to think about engaging a salesperson? And, uh, you know, what could you expect to get out of one, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Because I think if if you are the visionary, then you you know that. And you need one of the, the best things that I've been able to do is delegate within our, you know, organization. Uh, because I, I'm a true believer that, you know, everybody needs a role. And, and everybody has a, a giftings and if it, we're, we're all excellent at something, right? And so the pilots need to fly, the chefs need to cook, everybody needs a specific role within a company. And I know as the owner, the entrepreneur, nobody can do it as good as you, right? Like that's, but you got to get that mentality out of your head because even if you can hire somebody that can do it at least 80%, you know, or even 60% to the, to the effort of what you can do it, that's still going to be more productive for you to focus on your time in energy and efforts on what you do best. And if that is, you know, tinkering with the product or making it better then great. Um, but then hiring the right people, surrounding yourself with the right people, uh, it ha- is really what had catapulted our companies and allowed me to scale, uh, early on. And, you know, finding the right salespeople can be tough, right? There's a, there's a lot of shady, slimy people out there, and so, uh, you know, the hiring process can, can certainly be tough. And then that's why we, we brought that kind of in-house and, and provide that for, for um, clients as well. Uh, and, and we do, you know, hiring, can do hiring all throughout the country if need be for, for our clients, because that is a, a specific um, niche, I guess uh, we'll call it, that, that it's, it's hard to find those good quality people. And then having that company culture, you know, that, that is you, the visionary, the entrepreneur, like, what is that culture like? And, you know, how, again, just like we're going to craft a message to get people to, to come to our events so you can sell your products, we're going to craft a message that is built based upon who you are and the company that you're looking to provide or, or looking to, to build here. And so starting with the end in mind, we identify that and then we can, you know, cast that net, sift through the sand and find those right salespeople. Uh, and, and they might not be all in-house. Like per- personally, we have over 20 sales reps that all that live in 20 different states right now, you know, for, for one of my companies. Um, so it depends upon your, uh, 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 what do I want to say? It depends upon the type of business that you are and your look geographically, your location on how we would go about finding those and recruiting those right sales reps, um, and, and, you know, building out the right compensation plan and things like that. Well, and I suppose that part of it is looking out for certain characteristics that some people might have. Like you, 
can leverage your experience to understand what makes a good salesperson. So as you're doing interviews and things, you can figure that out. Do you actually help coach a, an organization though in, in, I guess, making that transition? Cause you know, again, and, and this, you know, actually is from my experience, you know, thinking about trying to hire a salesperson in the past, um, you know, like I wouldn't even know where to begin, you know, and it's not just about even finding that person, but how do I communicate to them what I need done and how do I make sure that they're aligned with what I'm doing and all that kind of thing. Like, I mean, is that something that you guys provide as your service as you sort of, I guess, coach up your client to make sure that they're communicating the right things to a salesperson in a way that makes sense to a salesperson? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Cause that's, that's a key component is, is how are you motivating them? Are the things that you're doing, motivating them for the right behaviors, right? Like for example, right now, my cousin just came over to the house the other day and he's on unemployment now. He's literally making more money on unemployment than he was at his job previous to, you know, the Corona thing. So he, he has zero incentive to want to go back to work. Like his company said, Hey, we're, we can go back to work. And he's like, nah, I'm cool. I'm just going to continually collect my unemployment. It's like, mm -hmm. you got to motivate and incentivize people to, with the right to, to want to do the right behaviors. Right. So that's definitely a key component in, in not only the hiring process, but just the ongoing training and part of that company culture that, that you're looking to build. Um, so we can, we can, you know, we train our clients to build that component into their hiring and recruiting process. And, and we obviously can't do this for everybody. So we, we often will like to more so you train the trainer type format, right? Like identify the, the key person within your business, and then we'll teach them what they need to do to build that company culture, how to recruit appropriately, incentivize appropriately. And then that was more of a tri trickle effect that'll happen throughout the actual organization. So you've, uh, you've mentioned a couple of times about um, your online uh, sales pipeline versus the uh, actual events that you, you have uh, with this COVID crisis that's going on right now and the lack of ability to get together and have these seminars. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you've changed your, your business model? Yeah. because of that and how you're, you know, because we're kind of in limbo right now. We don't know how soon things are going to open nationally versus just Florida or Texas or whatever. Yeah, you might right. be able to have seminars there. But for for the interim, uh, we're, we're all kind of stuck at home, but we still need to generate leads. Uh, can you right. talk about a, an online pipeline? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because that was when obviously when – Restaurants started to shut down in, in March. That was a huge, we, I literally in one week, we canceled 107 events throughout the country. Uh, th hundreds of thousands of dollars that I had, you know, not necessarily lost, because I still had those leads, um, but that we had invested, you know, paid down payments, things like that to these restaurants. Uh, so that was a, it was a very eye opening ex experience. Um, certainly, poked holes in, in our business model, right? So I always try to take, you know, what can I learn from this? There's no failure, there's only feedback, right? So what can I learn from this? And we immediately went to work. I mean, I've done webinars and different things in the past, uh, just, you know, promoting um, my company and things, but I, I hadn't really provided that as a service for our, our clients. And so we immediately went to work and, and built out our, our online platform um, in which, you know, within a few days we were driving traffic uh, we even did like sent direct mail to drive people to an online webinar. Uh, but then obviously we, we built out our, our online funnels through Facebook and, and, and things like that for some of our clients that are um, opting in for, for webinars. And it allowed us to, I, I think, you know, we're, we're coming out of this str stronger than ever as a company because it's allowed us to uh, increase our products and services for our clients that, you know, without through like continual trial and error but we've been able to monetize that uh you know as, as we're learning this process so it's it's going to be fantastic for us to be able to you know still offer those services and this is where you know dinner seminars might not make sense um but if we get on the phone and we determine that you know heck you could have a heck of an online funnel here we can build out a facebook campaign for you great you know our 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 services and product offerings have actually expanded because of this. I still fully, truly believe the dinner seminar format is always going to convert better. I, I just know it because it's what I've, I've done over the last decade with that in-person approach. But if you're, if you're 
product isn't of that ticket item that we had talked about, an online funnel might be a better format. And again, we've been able to do that now for our clients that have, you know, that have, are loving this because heck, some of them are realizing they don't need uh, these big buildings and, and all this, this overhead and this staff because they can automate things online now uh, versus, you know, having to, to do everything in person. Makes sense. Um, so that the online presence is a little different. Usually there's like a, a giveaway, like an ebook or, uh, you know, subscribe to our newsletter or this or that. And then you kind of start the funnel that way. Sure. Um, are there any other tactics that you might imply if you're designing your site or building it from the ground up? Uh, what are yeah. some things that you would implement into a, a sales funnel? Yeah, we still, uh, you know, certainly we've, we have ebooks, uh, there's always giveaways like like we offer our dinner seminar blueprint, right? People can go can go get our, our the blueprint of how to how to develop your own campaign. So there's 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 those offerings, um, but much like what we do with with you know our our dinner seminars, um, what we did personally because I wanted to look at you know how could I help with what's going on right now? All these restaurants are you know some of them are not reopening. They're they're they just couldn't you know sustain what the shutdown that we've, we've been going through. So what we did is we still offered a gift card to their local restaurant, right? It did two things. It, it helped provide that restaurant, you know, income when nothing was, was going on, they couldn't have patrons in their, their establishment. So, um, but also then that, that potential client of mine sees that in that we're still trying to add value and, and, and that's kind of that no like, and trust. Um, where if they opt in and you know book their consultation, we will provide them a twenty-five, a fifty, a hundred-dollar gift card to that local restaurant. Um, so it still helped out like these smaller. It worked extremely well in these more rural communities where you know it is a family-ran operation, um, and people wanted to do their part. Uh, so they would you know just get on a, a phone consultation. And then obviously at that point, the client needs to, you know, make sure that they can convert and they're using the proper language and things like that um, uh, over the phone versus actually in person. You know, I, I just want to say props to you on uh, offering the gift cards from the local businesses that are hurting. Uh, a lot of those companies are overlooked and the, uh, that's a good way for someone who wants to keep their favorite restaurant open during this time right. is to buy some gift cards and, and still support the business, even if you can't get the food. So Absolutely. props on that. Yeah. Um, one other question I have for you uh, comes directly uh, from direct mail marketing and how to, to set up a campaign. Uh, any good third party providers that you use? Uh, how do you niche down on your target demographic? Because um, you can almost get to the point where you can say, I want this zip code and I want people 65 and older. Is there... Um, a, a cheaper way to go about doing it than hiring a company to do it for you or is pretty much going after a company that already has these lists generated the, the best way to go? Yeah. So if you have an existing database that, you know, we can market to, obviously that's going to be the cheapest because then we don't have to buy the data, the list. You know, if you, if, if maybe you have a client or a customer that, you know, can be a repeat customer. You, you're now you're offering another product and you have their name, address, phone number, things like that. We can target them with, you know, just the cost of postage, essentially. Um, there's always every door direct mail, right? That's the postal service that just, you, the problem with that is you can't target. Everybody gets it. It's not personalized and it's, it's junk mail, right? That's really what it is. So why we, we focus on these targeted lists is it's a much higher response rate. Right. When I can send a, a, a personalized invitation out that says, uh, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, you're in cordially invited to, you know, Ruth's Chris Steakhouse or the Lone Star restaurant, whatever it is. And then it talks about, uh, you know, what you're going to be discussing at that event and, and things along those lines. So uh, but it can we can get so darn specific. Sometimes you can get too specific. Right. And we don't want to disqualify people by getting too specific, uh, but we want to get somewhat specific. And that's why we, we identify that client avatar. And as you mentioned, it's, uh, you know, uh, an age range, right? Uh, we can do single family dwelling units. So if they actually have that own that home, that property, they're not renting. Um, we can just do renters. Uh, we can do, you know, income. 
uh, which, you know, I'm looking for people that have an income over $75,000 a year or income producing assets, right? Because somebody who's retired might not have income anymore, but they have income producing assets like, you know, a half a million dollars in a 401k, like all that data is out there. And it just depends. The more layers that we add on, the more expensive that list tends to get. Uh, so we, we typically, you know, again, depending upon who you're looking for, right? Our investment club that we were, we were um, filling events for, they needed people that had um, like $2 million in, in income producing assets. And they had, you know, readily $500,000 in liquid cash, right? That they could invest. So we had to get hyper specific with that. Um, for a, uh, we've mentioned solar quite a bit here for a solar company. It's just, I want to make sure it's a homeowner, right? And certainly probably has some income. Um, and then we can look at the age range on who's making this. Does it make, is an 80 year old really going to do solar on their home when they're probably not going to get any ROI on it? Um, or is it a younger you know, group? So we want to, we, starting with the end in mind is, is where we figured all that out. Um, but if, if, if you're not getting specific, you know, every door direct mail, literally just paying for the price of postage. However, your response rate is going to be a lot less because it's not personalized. And, you know, it looks like just every other piece of junk mail that's out there. Because typically we want to get a, uh, it, typically at least a 1% response rate if we're looking at direct mail. So it's, it's why I love direct mail is it's easily measurable. If I send 5,000 pieces and I get 50 responses, cool. I got a 1% response rate. That makes sense. Um, you mentioned that the personalization matters uh, versus just sending a generic postcard. Uh, do you get down to, I mean, are you sending actual physical letters? Are you um, yeah. sending nicer postcards with their name printed on it? Like there's, there's little tactics in each, each one. What's your preferred method? Yeah, definitely a, a letter, like a wedding style envelope is great. Um, uh, because it is something it, it sets you apart and they can see their name on it um, versus because literally when people get their mail, this is what they're doing. They're standing over their garbage can and they, you got to catch their, their decision. Like they're either throwing it in the garbage or they're going to, you know, set it aside and then open it up after afterwards. So you got to catch them with something. Um, and postcards typically don't get as high of a response rate than an envelope in which they're actually going to take the time to open it and then read, uh, you know, what your offer actually is. Uh, we can get, you know, we can do specific pearls like, you know, when we were doing the, the energy conservation, we had a, a, a URL that was nopowerbill.com forward slash Betty Johnson, right? Their name, they're like, oh, I got my own website and people can go to that and, and then they can actually register for the events online. So there's, there's things that we've learned that get a higher response rate, um, you know, that, and that's kind of a B2C format, but B2B, if you're, if you're trying to attract a CEO or somebody else, I mean, if we send it to the business, there's usually a gatekeeper that's, you know, throwing all that junk mail away. So we might have to do something more savvy. Like we've, for example, have sent physical chairs, like <laughs> plastic chairs and, and uh, you know, with it, uh, a letter attached to it. But when they get that and they say, you know, Bill Johnson, you you need to take a, a seat and read what I have to tell you. That's going to capture, you know, there's some, some tricks to, to getting the right people that you want into your audience. We can get hyper specific or if it's, you know, just more general, that's obviously going to be less expensive. Uh, but then again, I don't really care. I never look at how expensive it is. I want to know what my ROI is going to be because if I can spend a hundred grand every week to get 300 grand, I would never not do that. Right. Right. Um, one last thing. So we're starting to get to the end of this thing, but I wanted to talk to you about one thing specifically. One thing I've observed, just over the course of this conversation, and uh, it's kind of a compliment, is just how adaptable you seem to have been throughout like this crisis and everything else. You know, you took a business that was predominantly predicated on the ability to take people to dinner and, uh, you know, quickly modified that to be able to go online and all that stuff. But I think it sort of circles back to something we were talking about at the beginning, which was, you know, understanding the benefits and those sorts of things and, and specifically identifying the needs of people. And so I wondered if you could just sort of talk a little bit about sort of the skills required or, you know, what you can do to help 
I, I guess, foster the ability to be able to identify the needs of people. And, uh, you know, it sounds like something that's maybe a little bit inherent in you, like it's just something you've always been good at, you know, you could sort of see a situation and recognize a need. But I wondered if just for people now who might be struggling in business, or maybe they want to use this as an opportunity to start a business, um, you know, are there tools or tricks or anything you can offer to sort of help people spot needs in the making that need to be addressed? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think all of it comes down to effectively communicating. Okay, so and why I, I had written this second book, and we have a, a sales training course that we're going to be releasing on that as well, is is because in sales, it's all about communication, right? To, to be able to ask the right questions to get people to, again, even if it is subconsciously, identify, oh, you know, I, I did need that, or I, you know, they, some people just don't know what they need, right? And, and you have to ask the right questions and get them to have that aha moment um, that, you know, your product or your service could actually help them. So I think whether, whether you're in sales or not, look up NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, okay? Just do a search on it, and there's tons of courses out there, there's tons of companies. Um, I got, I'm a master practitioner in NLP, and it's literally, it's not about sales, it's about to effectively communicate. What the course that I built is, is how to use NLP in the sales format, those five components of building rapport, you know, asking questions, um, identifying the need, linking the need, and then obviously closing the deal. So those how to effectively communicate and get people you know we're kind of pulling the string in, in our entire presentation our sales process where i'm i'm trying to get them like a kitty cat to just keep batting at my string right and and that's the goal of that and creating that environment where they just want what you have to offer versus actually feeling like they were sold something or pressured into to uh you know making a, a bad decision so anybody can benefit because I know I said whether you're in sales or not, I, I know we are all in sales. I don't care if you're the, the engineer at the company or the, you know, the, the janitor at the company, you're in sales, right? Because you're selling, if you're married, I'm selling my wife every single day why she shouldn't leave me, right? Like I, we're always selling something no matter what. As from the janitor, he's selling the kids to not put the gum under the the lunch uh, table, right? Like we're, there's always ways and levels of in which we can sell. And that all comes back to communicating effectively. And again, if I encourage anybody to look up NLP, neuro linguistic programming, and how that can be helpful um, in any relationship, you know, not just in sales itself. Yeah, I love that. I think that's really great. So um, we're almost at that time, Riley. Uh, do you want to tell people where they can find you and uh, any plugs you want to give real quick? Sure. Um, so RileyMeek.com is you know, a good site, I guess. Of course, it's a good site. Uh, but my name is obviously spelled a little different. R-Y-L-E-E-M as in Mary E-E-K, RileyMeek.com. Um, if anybody wants to look at uh, uh, like that blueprint that I had mentioned, Dinner Seminar Blueprint. Dot com. There's a, a you know we, a free download there. You can uh, get like a, a blueprint of what that actually looks like. Uh, uh, Socialdynamicselling.com. There's you know good resources on there. Case studies of clients that we've, we've worked with over the last few years. Um, I have a book, Food for Thought: How to Use Dinner Seminar Marketing to Grow Your Business in Ways You Never Thought Possible. Actually, we're we're doing a um, a kind of a free plus shipping offer on that, uh, and that's at Social Dynamic salesacademy.com. Um, I think it's like, I don't know, seven bucks or something like that, that um, they can get it. A physical copy will be sent out to them. It's also available on Amazon. Cool. Up. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to do this, Riley. I know things are crazy right now amid, uh, you know, crisis and everything else. And it sounds like you guys have been moving fast to keep up. So, yeah. uh, so thanks so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Ryan, Mike, thank you guys so much. This has been fun. Uh, yeah, absolutely. No and thanks so much to all our listeners. Everybody tunes in every week and uh, feel free to continue to support the show. It's eggscast.com and uh, we'll see y'all next time.